it is such a pleasure to have people come back on the podcast to talk to you. And this guest today has actually been on twice before, but he is he has so much information specifically around nutrition for our pets that I I just I I hope he continues to come on, but today we are going to be talking more about vegetables for dogs and fat. Ooh, that's a topic that we haven't really touched on, have we? Because fat, especially when we think about human uh, diets and the media, the marketing that we have been subjected to over the last, I don't know, 50-ish years, uh, fats have really been demonized. And it is his mission to change that because it's not at all true. Um, not when we think of it in terms of actual real food, at least. And we're also going to touch a little bit on the insidious nature of AFCO. If you're not familiar with AFCO, um, uh, maybe this is your fir po first podcast you're ever listening to from me. I'm not sure. American Association of Feed Control Officials is what AFCO stands for. And they are not a regulatory body, but they provide guidelines that the states then adopt as regulation for pet food. It's a whole twisted web. He explains this so much better than I do. Um, we also talk a little bit about the company that he works, well, a lot about the company he works for because I am a very proud supporter of this company, not just because I trust it and feed it to my pets, uh, but I also recommend it to clients and I, I just love their mission. I love how they source. I love the uh, way that the animals are treated, that they use in their products. There's there's so much to it. It's a small business. It's a, it's a small company. It is a woman-owned and founded business, which is a big plus for me. Um, doesn't have to be for you. I'm just letting you know where I'm coming from. So today, I want to welcome back to the Pet Parenting Reset, Billy Hookman. He is Vice President of Nutrition and Communication for Green Juju, which is one of my absolute favorite. I have like literal, literally a handful of companies that I love and trust. And then there are a few like kind of trailing on the back end that are like, yeah, these are pretty good too. We'll, we'll go with those. Um, and Green Juju is one of them. So please welcome back to the Pet Parenting Reset, Billy Hookman. So happy to you, have you here. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, okay, you recently came on. We talked about HPP, which is wonderful. And then it's been almost a year since you first came on. And we were talking about goat's milk. We were talking about veggies for dogs. And, you know, people's attention spans are really, really short these days. So, um, I want to expand on that some, but I want to kind of do like a little recap refresher. And since I just got a delivery of raw goat's milk, let's talk about that first. <laughs> um, and why you love it so much. I know why I love it so much. I mean, it's, it, it's an integral part of my dog's diet every day. And I don't know what I would do without it at this point, but um, I'm not the expert on it. You are. So tell me about it. Well, it's just, it's just what all of us in the nutrition sort of industry and formulation, and um, people who make products, it's, it's what we're trying to do. You know, it's what we're trying to make when we make a complete and balanced food. So I think that, you know, our freeze dried food at Green Juju and what will soon be the same formula frozen is, I think, the best food on the market, uh, just based on, you know, how we formulated it. But that's a human that's taking our limited knowledge of nutrition and, and it's just uh, milk is the only food that's made by nature to be food. And it's applicable to all mammals because all milks are made of exactly the same stuff in differing amounts, whether it's a cow or a human or a dog or a cat or a goat or whatever you're um, drinking at that point. And so I, I, I love it as a nutrition concepts 
to the point where I wish my dog would thrive on an all milk and egg diet. It's just not his, it's just not how his particular body works. But the idea of doing that is, I think, pretty awesome. And I think um, I've seen a lot of animals thrive on that. But yeah, I wish I could do that. My dog's sort of ungrateful and, you know, doesn't uh, always jive with the things I want to do nutritionally. I also, he's kind of a guinea pig as well. So I, you know, test a lot of new products on him and, and, you know, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, it's just, it's the most complete, it's the most nutrient diverse food on the planet has the most nutrients we've discovered in a food, which makes sense because it's made to sustain something completely. It's made to grow something, um, which means that, and it's nutrition that's in a very high moisture environment. So all of those things are very, um, uh, efficient and don't take a ton of work from the body to, uh, digest and contains everything you need in regard to bacteria and, uh, prebiotics. And, you know, the fat profile is, is incredible and it's very high in something called CLA, which is a omega six, um, uh, cancer fighting fatty acid, which, you know, is found in highest amounts of butter, but it naturally contains basically everything we've discovered. And so, um, it's just also, you know, I think anyone who has any reservations about it is just really speaking to what we've done to it in the last, you know, however many years and industrialized it and pasteurized it and, you know, fed the cows the wrong things and made it less healthy than it ultimately could be. So it's been, you know, I've been in the industry like 15 years now or something like that. And it's been cool to kind of be on the forefront of, you know, educating about raw milk. Yeah, I know my between my clients and my students, they probably get tired of me talking about it because I don't know if like I ever have a conversation with anyone ever without talking about it. <laughs> so um I love it. And and I just want to keep keep talking about it because new and different people are constantly listening. Um and that was something that Green Juju added on not long after you joined. So that was, I'm sure, something that you had a huge, huge role in. But Kelly already, of course, she started with all the vegetables and all the veggie. Well, yeah, the, I don't know. Did she? She had all three blends when you started. Yes. Uh, yeah, the uh, two and then the golden blend came out like basically right when I started. So okay. yes, basically three. Yeah. So when we talked last time about vegetables, we primarily talked about the fiber component, um, really because that's where my head was at because of what I was working on with my dog and trying to get more fiber into her diet. But vegetables actually have a lot of other benefits, not just for us, but for our dogs. And even you could say for our cats in some cases as well. Um, and the fiber aspect is really, really important, but I was trying to do some research for this and found the um, polyphenols that are in vegetables are so important for our gut microbiome. Is that something you can talk about? Well, yeah, I mean, I think... <laughs> I think the important thing about plants is, you know, I think in anything in nutrition, we just need to use things for what their strongest benefit is. And I think anytime, whether it's human diets or pet diets, I think once we get out of that realm is when we start to run into, you know, not using nutrition efficiently. Um, and what I mean by that is like, um, so if you take, animal products. Animal products are typically higher in fat than especially what we're using, unless you're talking about plants like coconut oil and some seeds and, and some plants that are actually just naturally higher in fat generally, um, or not seeds, but like nuts or something like that. Right. Um, and so that's typically where you carry those like fat soluble vitamins because they're actually in the fat content of those things. And so plants, 
I think are really great for water soluble vitamins. Um, you know, uh, host of B vitamins, all of those ones that you would essentially not store in fat that you pee out when you don't use them and you need to kind of, you know, like ingest more and more of them because your dog's body or your body only has a specific sort of like digestion rate. Um, and so those are the ones that you find on some of the like AFCO profiles that, you know, you're going to only find in plant content, which I think can be very, very important. And most of those, it doesn't, doesn't really matter what the diet is um, that you're feeding. If you're feeding our veggie blends, you're going to meet those requirements. Not that those requirements are like, you know, the gold standard or anything like that. Cause I think it kind of, I think AFCO has just generally like narrowed us into maybe the wrong way of looking at nutrition, even, even sometimes on the holistic side uh, of how we do that. And so I think, but yes, the antioxidant content as well. So if we're looking for those things that are good in plants, especially green plants that are low in carbohydrates, um, yeah, I think antioxidants play a role in the gut, but I think they also play a role in, in, you know, reducing inflammation. I think they play a role in, in, um, just generally. And that, that does go to things like polyphenols, but, but it also goes to, you know, antioxidants like beta carotene and antioxidants, you know, um, what's the other one I'm thinking of? Um, uh, I don't know why I can't think of it. It's in lemons. It used to be called vitamin P until they figured out what they were, but I'll think of it. But, um, so you have all these host of things, and this is where it also comes back to the veggie blends because you don't want to be like, you know, again, we're, we're really trying to medicinize food now in a lot of ways in the holistic industry. And so what you don't want to do is go like, oh, beta carotene is effective. So let's, you know, isolate it and make a supplement out of it. And the veggie blends really come into, we need to get as many different types of antioxidants into the system because that's what you know, dogs evolved into is, is eating, you know, a lot of different types of foods, including plant foods, you know, uh, wolves and blueberries and things like that. So, yeah, I do think the antioxidants are important. I think everything affects the gut. Um, and then also the mineral content as well. Um, so especially when you're using, let's say you're using something like BAMS beets or, um, you know, the mineral content of those and those, some of those root vegetables is going to be very, very high. And so that again is a, is a good mixture of that. And then I think the really underrated thing of, of plants in general, it's my own little theory, but is, you know, kind of exposure therapy, which is kind of like, in my opinion, one of the reasons that we see so many reduced allergies is because with the blend specifically, and this is like a case study in, you know, Kelly creating these and, you know, for the last 10 years, people telling her, oh, I started using Just Greens and my dog's allergies are significantly reduced. And my theory behind that is that you're exposing them to plants and all of those chemical compounds, 8,000 phytonutrients in, it, in every plant. You're exposing them to that every single day in which most animals who are on processed diets aren't exposed to those things because a lot of those things are very fragile and they're cooked out of whatever you're using. And so um, I think all those things are super relevant and I think they all sort of work together. I know that when I feed Huckleberry, you know, the blends are really the linchpin that really holds his diet together and keeps his um, digestion where I, where I need it to be. Um, and it's not gonna ever be like the, the biggest calorie makeup so like if I'm feeding, you know, two tablespoons of um, uh, Bailey's blend, which I did this morning is probably, you know, under 20 calories, but that doesn't mean that it's not making a huge impact. And, and just plants in general, I've seen a lot of, um, I've had, you know, I had my eyes opened up a lot and, you know, I love learning. So that's part of it. But, you know, even if you look at what I commonly feed my dog, all of my ferments are plant-based, um, you know, in my whole food, uh, in my whole food probiotics, some of which can't talk about because, you know, 
they're they're likely to be on on, on a pet store near you on uh, uh, via green juju. Um, but even even now, you know, I've gotten into the habit while well, while I'm still feeding the freeze dried food before the frozen comes out of of rehydrating that with you know medicinal mushroom broth. And um, so I think plants are as important. They're just important for different reasons, and they're never going to make up the bulk of the calories. But um, and a side note, I think, especially with freeze dried food or with the frozen food, I think we found a way to really make it easy for people to engage in that type of diet, which is like, let's make up the diet of the most efficient, nutrient dense things we can heart, liver, kidney. In my case, you know, I was at recommend adding eggs and, you know, things like sardines and those types of things. And then let's just vary up the plants as much as possible. And I think it's a really good because it keeps the carbohydrates really low as well. And so I think it's a really great way that we can actually reverse a lot of the stuff that dogs are dealing with. And hopefully, you know, with breeders and even, you know, that kind of thing, we can get people to start feeding diets like this long term and, you know, give it a couple generations and we could maybe start to see, you know, genes not expressing in the worst way possible. That'd be the hope. So that was the um, longest answer to a simple question. I apologize. It's no, it's not a simple question. So I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful. Um, there were a few things you said in there, and some some of the questions that I thought of, we may actually have to move to another episode. But one of the things you said, um, or you kind of alluded to, was with the way I heard it was that we kind of can lose some of these nutrients that are, are more volatile, I think was the word. I don't know. You might've used a different mm -hmm. word when we cook them. Um, because I know a lot of people do cook food for their dogs and it's generally recommended when you are feeding vegetables to either like steam them, cook them, or like blend them, puree them, whichever way to break it all, all down prior to feeding so you're saying it would actually be better to do the like blending pureeing and not cooking yeah well i think uh you know at, at green juju we do something even a third option which is we juice them and then we add the pulp back to it so that's an even better way to break down still keep it in a raw food state i think cooking for your dog is great i really do um you're just it's it's a give and take some nutrients are are more available when you cook and some are not. Um, I find in my research that the, it's kind of like in milk, like the, the sort of really fragile ones um, are not going to be there. Um, I would prefer to open up a food in most cases with like fermentation or, you know, so like if you were going to use Bailey's blend and that's been juiced, and add the pulp back so you break it down cell walls. And then if you choose to ferment it, say on your countertop, the bacteria are gonna start eating it. So it's gonna open up the food even more. It's gonna create new nutrients. And so that's, it's kind of, actually it's a good, um, a good example of that is our golden paste. So the golden paste essentially, um, instead of cooking it, we are letting bacteria eat it. And so I guess I'd rather do one of those two things when it comes to vegetables. But if someone is making an amazing food for their dog at home and, you know, steaming vegetables and um, that's incredible. And I think that there's tons of ways to feed dogs and cats. And I think that, you know, if anybody tells you that you have the exact right way to do it for every dog or cat, they're just lying to you because it's, it's as diverse as human diets, you know, within, within a, a certain range. And so uh, I think if that makes you happy, go for it. What an answer. So, <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to talk to you about today was uh, something that I saw you talk to Dr. Katie Woodley about recently, which was on fats and, um, kind of how we are, are all viewing fats wrong, uh, or many of us are viewing fats in the wrong way. And I don't 
want you to go through the whole lecture again, obviously, but um, I, there are concerns, certainly with some dogs who have various illnesses, diseases that maybe, maybe don't want to feed them as much fat, but I think that's a small percentage. And overall, we're, we're just looking at fats the wrong way. There's, you know, this big marketing campaign that, that at least our government did in the U.S. that made all of us humans feel like we are not supposed to be eating fat. And it's kind of trickled into what we feed our pets to. And can you talk to talk on that just a little bit? Yeah, actually, it's a great it's a great topic um, because it does come from human nutrition. It does come from what people said that really wasn't how the science works, you know, for many, many years in human nutrition. And, and it goes, you know, it goes back to like my mom's generation, which, you know, still, you know, eating low fat things. And, and I was actually thinking about a lot, a lot about how to frame this and sort of, I do a lot of, you know, obviously talks and things like that. And the way that I want to frame this is like, you know, something's bad when everyone talks about it and they say healthy fats, which is like the most annoying phrase nutritionally. Because it is it when you when somebody says healthy fats, what they're saying is that fat is not healthy, but here's some exceptions that are healthy. But that's not really how it works in nature. Anything that is abundant in fat and actually comes from nature is healthy. Um, is it, and when you get away from those things, when you start to make fat out of things that don't aren't abundant in nature and you wouldn't consume in nature, um, that's really where the science shows that you get into the unhealthy range. Here's a good example of that. When you do certain chemical processes in um, especially things like, you know, chips and things like that, you create something called trans fats. And everybody said, oh, trans fats, they're, they never leave your body. They're terrible. They're, you know, and so there's a big movement to get trans fats out of food. What a lot of people don't know is that trans fats naturally occur in meat products and they're actually healthy for you if they actually come from nature versus having been created um, in foods. And so everything is sort of like that. So I, th I think the, the cross that people bear is like saturated fat's bad and then here's healthy fats. What they don't understand is that saturated fat is actually really good for you. And it actually does help. It's in, you know, it makes up 50% of every cell in your body and in your dog's body. It, um, all of these things have a purpose. Um, it's kind of like human, it's kind of like cholesterol in human nutrition. It's a widely misunderstood uh, topic as far as does food affect it. Um, and so because of that, people sort of look at it like, okay, we know we need some fats, but we want to, you know, do healthy ones and we want to limit it. But you don't really need to limit it unless you're dealing with some extreme health condition, which that could be said about anything. You could have to limit any nutrient. Um, and it puts people in a bad position because then people are like, you know, how do I make up my dog's ideal diet? I want something that's, you know, low in fat and moderate in protein and carbohydrates. Well, that's impossible, right? Because the rest of the diet would be air. Because once you take something away, you have to add something else. It's a pie chart. Uh, of those three sort of macronutrients. And so um, if you're doing low carb, which is generally the best thing for dogs and cats, you're going to make up the diet. The rest of the diet has to be protein and fat. And so if that is the case, um, I think you're generally shooting for like 50% of the calories coming from fat. So like if you take green juju diets, like the, the, um, the rabbit is probably less than that offhand. But if you look at, um, let's say the beef, um, the beef is, uh, slightly more calories in fat, but they're about the same. And that's like the low end of what you're looking. That's like the, that's like the low end of a one-to-one -one fat to protein diet. If you do it by calories, right? So in, in that case, um, you might feed 150 calories in protein and 150 calories in fat. Um, and just for the people listening, it means there's going to be about half the amount of fat in the diet because 
a gram of fat has nine calories and a gram of protein has four calories. So if I eat something that has 10 grams of, of protein and five grams of fat, you're going to have an equal amount of calories roughly in both of those. Um, and then on the high end, you go into other diets that might be the same. Say you look at a diet and it says 13% fat, 13% protein. That's actually going to be way more calories than fat. Um, now in the formulation we did, we were just doing it off of what are the natural fat ratios of using a high organ based diet. And so that's where we didn't mess with that at all. Um, and we got some interesting results. I mean, basically the goat, pork, beef, and bison were the same basic fat, uh, to protein ratio. The lamb, even though it's almost all, so it's heart liver, and then we use um, necks that have some of the residual meat on it for the, the bone content, um, just much higher in fat. Um, and so, you know, we do have a higher fat option, um, higher in calories. So I think that people need to stop viewing fat as a, oh, we have to do this and view it as this is as important as protein. And it plays as vital a role and we want it to, to be there. And it's exactly, um, like I said, in the talk, if you look at our diets and you look at the fat breakdown, which we did the full nutrient panel for all of our diets on, on the fat side, yes, you have amazing omega three to six ratios, but those are still a smaller percentage of the fats. I think people also get the impression that like, oh, if you use you know, pasture raised beef or grass fed beef, you're going to get most of the fat's going to be omega-3. Now the ratio is going to be good, but most of the fat's going to be saturated fat. And actually that is the fat that your dog needs most of. Um, and so I hope, you know, I, I'm trying to do my best to get a paradigm shift there to, uh, so we can realize like this is in another good example of that milk, uh, milk per, um, per ounce has one gram of fat and one gram of protein. That means if you put a dog on a milk diet, um, for a very health condition, they're going to get double the amount of calories from fat than they are protein. And so, um, uh, that is a, you know, one to one by weight and two to one by calories, ketogenic diet. Um, if you, I mean, I guess you could call out the carbohydrate content from the lactose, but if say you fermented it or, you know, reduce the lactose, you could do a real true uh, ketogenic diet there. So hopefully, um, you know, and, and that's my, I think fats might be my favorite thing to learn about just cause there's so much cool information on it. Um, so hopefully, you know, I'll be on the road this year doing some, some speaking things throughout the country, excited about that. And, you know, there'll probably be a good, good deal with those on maybe changing that paradigm. I, you know, everything you say just makes me think of so more things, <laughs> so many more things. I now I'm like super interested in the, the role that fats play with hormones that just popped in my head. So I'm going to get a look at that a little bit more when we get off of this call. But um, yeah, it's interesting. The, what is naturally occurring in these animal products and i i just think of like what my dog will and won't eat or like what she likes better than others and um recently i found out that she's she will eat the bison but it's not her favorite so she's how really, dare really she loves, i know she really really loves um the rabbit i think is her favorite and then the beef and pork but again, I haven't been able to get the goat and lamb, so I don't know where those would fall on her little hierarchy of what she likes. But well, um, once the once the frozen comes out, it'll be in everything but bison. So she should be really happy. She will. She will be happy because she definitely <laughs> likes frozen. Like I have been feeding her a lot of freeze dried lately, and she loves. She eats it. She loves it, but she definitely loves her frozen. So not, I don't feed it frozen. I don't know why I just felt the need to say that. Anyway. Um. <laughs> oh, I get it. Yeah, frozen food that's been thawed. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. because I saw somebody on TikTok recently literally like feeding frozen bricks of raw food to their dogs. And I was like, 
oh lord help me like i just wanted to like reach in the, through the screen and be like please stop doing this <laughs> <laughs> um so i guess that now has me like constantly thinking about the words i'm using and how people might might hear them um so you were you recently joined um, myself and Pam and Janet on Pet Health Junkies, and you had a lot of really interesting things to say about the role of the pet food industry in general, um, and some of the some of the things you've learned through um, attending AFCO meetings. And I don't know if, if you'd like, you know, I don't. We don't I have some overlapping audience, but not all overlapping audience. So I, I just found that to be so interesting. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that a little more. I got to tell you, I don't remember what we talked about. I'm I'm terrible at that. I actually have people. I was in Canada at a show because uh, we just started distribution in Eastern Canada. So I was up in Toronto area last week. And, um, this guy came up to me and he's like, oh, I just listened to this podcast and no clue. I had no clue what I talked about. Uh, I have a very short term memory. I also don't listen to anything that I'm ever on. Uh, I just, you know, I, yeah, it's not fun to listen to yourself. So, um, we could definitely talk about AFCO, but I, but <laughs> I don't remember what we talked about. So, um, well, I, I guess in a nutshell, you we were you're talking about it's like more it's worse than we think, and we think it's bad. Yeah, well, and I will give a shout out to. There's actually an AFCO meeting going on right now, so I go to the summer one because it's more relevant, and I can't really justify going to the mid year one, but. Um, Shout out to Kathy Alanobi, who runs Next Gen Pet Food Manufacturers, who we're a part of, who represents a bunch of different small brands at, at AFCO meetings. And, uh, you know, my mentor and, and one of my very best friends, Roxanne Stone, um, is also there. Uh, and uh, I think I think Chelsea's there, too. Um, Chelsea can. So it is cool to see other people who are, um, they texted me for a, they wanted me, even though I'm not at the meeting, they wanted me to find a restaurant <laughs> to go to for them to go to. So, cause that's the reputation every time we go to these meetings, except for the fact that Susan Fixton won't really leave the hotel. Um, I have to find the restaurant. So, uh, luckily they ended up finding something on their own, but shout out to those guys for going in and representing, uh, that, but yeah, I mean, there's just a small amount of people who go to these things. Um, and, and you can't really, the, 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 the first thing to know is whether it's a veterinarian or you're dealing with or something like that. And they're talking about AFCO. Um, you can't really know unless you actually go to the meetings. You, you, cause you don't know the politics behind the recommendations. In fact, most people aren't even looking at the recommendations. Like we have to look at this a lot because of if we don't, we can't sell in States essentially. Um, so it was very interesting going up to Canada because Canada is like a free for all. Like you can literally put complete balance on anything. There's no standard for anything. So like you could grind up a fish and be like, this is a complete meal. So like, uh, so that's interesting. It's kind of a bit freeing if you're like us and we actually do the right thing, but you could see how someone would obviously take advantage of that. But the first, the first thing about AFCO is, um, yeah, you can't really know the politics behind the lobbyists, the FDA, all that stuff, unless you actually go and observe it. Um, so, you know, if you have a veterinarian who's like, oh, that food doesn't follow AFCO, they don't actually know anything about AFCO. Um, and I highly doubt anyone is, most people are buying, there's something called the official publication, which is like $225, which basically explains all the rules every year. And they have a new edition every single year. And I highly doubt people are actually looking at that. And so, uh, most of it is just conjecture, like AFCO is a standard. Well, great. Um, and it is worse than people think. I mean, it, it is 
you have to, in, in going there, you realize that the only reason the pet food exists in large part is because it's a vehicle for recycling waste somewhere that's not a landfill. And they call it recycling at the meeting. I'm not just, you know, putting words in their mouth. So the thing I would say to that is my dog's not a landfill. I don't want him to eat secondhand things and, and things that were made to use biodiesel fuel and all these things they want to get into the, into the, into food generally. Um, and then the other part is all the regulations are written for corporations, large corporations. So they're all like weird processing terms because they're, they're pet food. This holistic movement is so such a short time period in, in the, in, you know, the history of pet food that it's getting better now because the consumers are kind of demanding it. So that's a good thing, but um, it's still really hard to operate within that system. Um, and I would like to t let people know anyone can go to the meetings. Anyone can go to the meetings and anyone can ask questions. It costs $500 to get in. You also have to travel to wherever it is this year. It's actually close to you this year. It's actually in San Antonio, Texas. Oh, it's um, so beautiful in San Antonio. <laughs> see, see, I'm telling you, uh, but the problem is, you know, the admission fee and then, you know, so, so like for Green Juju, it's a necessary thing, but we also have to pay for me to come down and, and meals and all that stuff. So, but it is close to you. And, but, but if somebody was really motivated to, you know, try and hold people's foot to the fire and to, um, make a difference, uh, you know, every committee. So there's basically like two committees, there's ingredient definitions committee, and then the pet food committee. So like, really, you're going down there for like, I don't know, three hours of meetings, or, or maybe that one, maybe the pet food meetings longer, but it's not you might go down there four days, but you know, two or three days, but it's not like it's like continual sessions. It's like there's really only two but if you go to those two sessions, they have microphones and you can walk up and say whatever you want. And so if people would like to do that, I would encourage it. Um, you can sit with our little group of holistic people that no one talks to and everybody ignores like we're in high school and we'll have fun. <laughs> like we're in high school. That sounds horrible. But <laughs> yeah, well, it's yeah, it's just funny. Like we're we're definitely. You know, in the with the people I sit with, we're the weirdos of the entire experience. So it's it's you know, you do what you can. <laughs> so it it is where and, and I'll I'll direct people to that episode of Pet Health Junkies to hear more. But it is it sounds because I haven't been there. To your point, it sounds so much worse than than. I even thought it was before hearing you talk about it. Um, and so that kind of makes me think of how companies like Green Juju are doing things more, you know, you, you have a, a very strong, um, like moral and ethical reasoning for what you're doing, for how you're sourcing foods, whether it's plants or animal sources of foods and I think that's important to highlight not just because that's what we want to see in the industry but I think most people just don't know and don't understand and they really do want to feed their pets that way they're just they just don't know they they don't know what's really happening behind closed doors at these huge pet food companies um so I I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that a little bit more again. Um, we probably have talked about that, but I, you know, it's, it's, I think one of the, one of the um, pillars of, of green juju is your sourcing. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about that again. Yeah. Well, I think the average person thinks like, oh, this is regulated and is on the shelf. So it must be safe and healthy, but just couldn't be further from the truth because that's not, the goal is to, to put, the goal is not to make the healthiest pets possible. Um, we know that because the, the old guard of formulating were like, well, why do you use this ingredient? Well, that's what we use in pet food, you know? So we have to 
make the best of X, but that's not what we want to do. Just because the government pays people to grow corn doesn't mean we should use it in our pet food. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons I joined Green Juju was exactly, you know, the, the, the ethics and the, um, uh, what Kelly had built before I got there. And, you know, I, we had known each other since pretty much the inception of Green Juju. And I had, I had always respected what she had done, quality standards that she had set. And I was, you know, looking, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but I sought her out and said, Hey, I want to work for you. Um, luckily she wanted me to work there. So I'm, I'm not, uh, unemployed. So that's good. Um, but so that was my joke, by the way, I am really funny. I don't know if you know that, but, um, so, but, you know, I sought her out because I saw, you know, the things that I value, which are, you know, ethical sourcing, both, both for the animal itself and the life they get to live as well as the, um, nutrition that comes into it and just using whole foods and really trying to push the envelope. I mean, she was the first person to do the veggie blends in the pet food industry. She was the first person to use bone broth in a product in the pet food industry at a time when like, you know, that was, you know, five years ahead of, you know, most other companies. And so, um, people hadn't really considered that. And so, uh, our sourcing is, we have to be good at it because of the way that we formulate. So like in our foods, um, you know, our, our bison and is from Wyoming and Colorado are, is grass fed. Our beef is obviously grass fed is from Pacific Northwest or pigs are pastured from the Pacific Northwest. Our ducks come from California, which are actually outside and engaging in actual free range behaviors. Our, uh, rabbits are from Spain where we can find ethically raised and harvested rabbits. Our goat and lamb is from Australia is grass fed and also half the goat is wild harvested. Um, you know, even if you look at our bone broth, our, um, venison broth is also wild harvested, um, to control, a, a populational growth, um, in both cases. And so if you don't for whatever goes into that animal is just affecting the food. So even if you're just doing it for selfish purposes and you want to have the healthiest food possible, that's a good enough reason to do it. In fact, there's a, there's a brand. It's interesting. There's a brand called D'Artagnan meats. It's a owned by this French woman. I've, I've met with the company before and I think they're located in New Jersey, but it was really interesting because they have excellent quality standards. And she said, we didn't do this because we were overly concerned about this welfare of the animal. It's because it tastes the best, which I thought was a really interesting, you know, um, and if the byproduct is animals get a better life, then that's great. But so whatever you're putting in, you get out of that. And then all of our vegetation is, or is organic and it is with the exception of the turmeric, which is a cool story. Everything is exactly what goes into like organic grocery stores. Like the example I always bring up is if you're feeding BAMS beets, those beets and purple cabbage are from the Lancaster farm fresh, farm fresh co-op, which is the same beets and the same purple cabbage that's on the whole food shelf in Lancaster where I live, uh, right? When you walk in the turmeric is just a funny one because we actually buy the turmeric, so, uh, the turmeric that's too ugly for whole foods. So it's exactly the same turmeric. It's just, they like to look a certain way. Um, and then we have something in development that is really interesting that um, is along the same lines, which I think will be really cool, which uh, obviously can't say anything about. You won't have to wait long because I think it'll be out in March uh, with the food. So that's really exciting. Um, but we're kind of doing something in, uh, in that vein of sourcing. So I'm, I'm excited about that as well as well, but it's just something that I would only use the things that I would feed my own family. Um, and I have a very being living in Lancaster and, you know, having people raise animals for me for most of the meat I eat, like a good example. I just, uh, my butter guy, um, who 
Well, he's, he does more than butter, but I buy so many pounds of raw butter from this guy, but he also does kombucha. He does a lot of stuff, but my butter guy, um, Chris, who processed the pig that we're currently eating is also going to do about 20 whole pasture raised chickens for me. And then actually, you know, process those chickens and, and give us like breasts and thighs and, you know, that, you know, actually cut them up. And so that matters to me that those chickens are on fresh grass every day. It matters to me that they'll have the better omega three to six ratio, that they'll be able to actually have happy lives for the you know time that they're with us. And the same thing is true with green juju. You know, I don't want to cut corners just because um, it's, you know, Huckleberry is a member of our family. Uh, Huckleberry is Maple's best friend. And anyone that's Maple's best friend needs to live forever, essentially. So, um, although I think Huckleberry likes me the best, I don't want to brag about that, but I will because in my house, I am not the most well liked by anyone, probably. But I think Huckleberry likes me the best because he comes and sits between my legs over everyone else. So I will take that as a win. And, but going back to the point, he's a member of our family and he deserves to eat the best possible diet. And so that's how I look at everything I formulate for Green Juju. And I know Kelly is exactly the same way. Well, I made so many notes um, about different things that I want to ask you about. So hopefully I can have you back on to ask you <laughs> these things, but I know you're, you have another meeting to get to. So I want to say thank you um, for being here again and for expanding on some of the things we've talked about in past episodes. And um, of course, always highlighting Green Juju. I, I, Obviously, this is this is my podcast. I don't like nobody tells me what to put on, but me. <laughs> nobody is you know paying for spots for me to advertise on. So I'm really really particular about the not just the people that I bring on the podcast, but the brands that I may or may not highlight. So um, thank you for being on and talking about Green Juju because it is something that I enjoy feeding my dog and that I recommend a lot to my clients. So having the like behind the scenes for them as they're listening to the podcast is fun and exciting. And I always get tons of messages like, oh my gosh, that's what you told me to feed. So it's fun <laughs> to have you on. No, oh, that's great. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, and I'm happy to come on again. We, um, you know, we're just a small company that's trying to do the best we can. And um, it really does take people like you and stores to sell our food and, and to really educate people and have that connection with those pet parents, because I'm, you know, just one person and Kelly's one person and, and, you know, we do all the nutritional stuff for the company. And so it's, it's amazing to see those connections. And, and I, I think every step of that process is equally as important as every other step. And so I just appreciate the opportunity to be here and, uh, continue to live my dream. Oh, well, thank you so much.